Friday, June 8th, uh, 2018. Uh, Joey Plaster here with Jonathan Ned Katz in his apartment in the village. And um, yeah, so we're gonna be uh, talking mostly about the legacy of Stonewall and the early gay liberation movement. But why don't we start out and can you just give some general background information when you were born, where, uh, that kind of thing? I was born in 1938, and um, I um, moved to the house that I'm in right now when I was two. Uh, so I've always lived in Greenwich Village, um, and um, I went to the Little Red Schoolhouse in Greenwich Village, a private school, progressive school. And then I went to Music and Art High School, and I majored in art. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a wonderful experience going to this wonderful public art and music high school. Can you say a little bit about your, your mom and your dad, what they were like? Uh, my mother was an editor on Parents Magazine, telling mothers and... I guess especially mothers, how to bring up their children. She was editing articles about how to bring up your children. Um, my father was in advertising, and he was an advertising art director, but he, on the outside, he was very interested, uh, before most white people were um, interested in black history, and the uh, situation of uh, black people in America, prejudice against black people, and he knew a lot about uh, black people. So he, he taught me a lot that most white kids weren't hearing. And I marched with him in May Day parades, and we were for progressive causes. We were for an eight-hour day and more wages for working people, and good things like that. And so your dad worked in advertising, but he also wrote historical texts? He didn't write historical texts. No. Well, he, he published one book, a, a collection of, uh, of uh, important articles on uh, black music. He put together this anthology, yeah. uh, but that's all. He didn't write it. Uh, so um, he did... He did uh, draft a book about a black pioneer woman in New England who was the first black woman to write a poem that we know about in New England. And I uh, was able to finish that after my father died. And it was, I think, the first book that I published. It's fiction. It began fiction because there wasn't um, uh, that much information available about the woman to make it a, a historical biography. Mm -hmm. And so how would you describe your politics growing up middle school and high school? Mm -hmm. Well, um, they were very progressive. Um, we were, it was the McCarthy period and, um, and uh, people with progressive ideas were were uh, looked up upon askance, and it was a scary period if you believed against the grain, if you were aware of the history of lynchings, for instance, uh, in America. Not many pe white people were thinking about that, and I was hearing about stuff like that from my father. Mm -hmm. And what do you mean that you were progressive? Like, what, what does that mean exactly? Um, uh, hmm. I don't know if I want to go into this on this, in this particular occasion. Okay. Um, what about your understanding and understanding of your own sexuality uh, as, a, as a young person before college? Okay. I was growing up in Greenwich Village, but... I was completely repressed. It was the, I was a teenager in the 1950s, and it was a very repressive period. And um, I, I uh, had no idea about my own sexuality as a teenager. I was just repressed at all. 
And I thought I was, a, if I thought about it at all, I was a sensitive heterosexual, like the, the boy in the play and movie, A Tea in Sympathy. He was sort of suspected because he didn't walk as butch as his, as the other guys in his college, and he hung up curtains on Indian Indian print curtains on his the windows of his dorm room. That was that was a suspect, and so um, he he turns out to be heterosexual. So um, which is proven at the end of the play by him going to bed with a the woman, a woman, and the, the, the evil character turns out to be gay, the, her husband turns out to really be gay. That, so that I, was, I was aware, I guess, of ne all negative images of homosexuals, uh, so I, who would want to be that? Um, so it wasn't until my first sexual experience with um, a, a fellow classmate from my high school that I opened my eyes and said, oh, the word homosexual applies to me, oh. And it was the beginning of my looking out on the world and wanting to be with other people and afraid of being with other people. And it was the beginning of becoming a more of a person. Mm. You mentioned that there were a lot of negative stereotypes. What what were those specifically at the time, and how did, how did you know about them? I'm assuming you're talking about the 1950s. Yeah. Well, like the play Teen Sympathy, I asked my aunt. She said, "What do you want for Christmas?" I said, "A ticket to see Teen Sympathy." Well. Why that play? It's about this boy accused of homosexuality. I went to the play, and so it's, it's so he proves it. He, you know, he's not. Thank God. So I was picking up on things like that, and I guess I was aware of. Yeah, I was aware of home. The word homo being used and fairy, and I heard it. You know, somebody. Oh, uh, the father of, of, a, of one of the students made a joke about. Oh, I was leaving that, her house after a visit, and the father said, uh, 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 let's see, how did it go? Uh, on, uh, 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 on something about, like, on your way homo. Oh, you're on your way homo. And I said, oh, you shouldn't use that word. It's, it's, I, I protested, which is interesting. Because I had a sense that people shouldn't be made fun of from my father. It was like that, an in, in injustice that people were made fun of for their sexuality or their, or their race or whatever, their being Jewish or whatever. So um, I picked up stuff from the time period. And then after that first... Um sexual encounter, you, you said that you opened up as a, as a person. What, what did that look like exactly? Well, it meant that I worried about not being normal. Part of me wanted to be normal and have a wife and two children and a dog and live in suburbia. And, um, but uh, another part of me was a rebel. But that part, so I was mixed uh, in feelings. Um, I started to go to therapy, which many people did, to say, I'm, I had, you know, I did this thing, I, I am this thing, this terrible thing. Um, so I began to think about my, my family background and 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 being sexual and um, yeah, uh, and I started going out with girls to some extent and fooling around and experimenting and learning like what the world is like, what sexuality is like in different ways. And so, when was that? Was that? that probably. 
Okay. Uh, you're hearing, you know. It's okay. Um, so when, when would that have been? Around what year? Uh, I went, I graduated from high school in 1956. So I went to Antioch College in Ohio for a year. Then I came back and went to City College for two or three years, two, or two years, I guess. And then I went to a few classes at different um, in, in different, uh, some at the new school. Um, but I dropped out. It was the 60s. You dropped out. You could drop out. My, I'm surprised that my parents weren't more worried about me not finishing college. They, they warned me, but they didn't seem that worried about it. Um, I did, I had some friends who worked as textile designers, some old family friends, wonderful couple. And um, I visited them one day and somebody said, oh, why don't you sit down and try this? So it turned out that I spent um, 12 years as a textile designer using my art ability. Um, uh, and, and that was a wonderful experience. It was in a crazy, uh, art studio where people were freelance, people were on salary. The owner of, of it was a very gay man who would dance in and demonstrate um, the, the American. At, he had just gone to the ballet the night before and he would be pirouetting around the room and, um, and there were a lot of gay people there and straight people. So it didn't mean you were gay if you worked there. Um, uh, it was a wonderful experience for me. I, I, I had a wonderful mentor there, a woman named Carol Joyce. She's uh, in her 90s now, and she was my mentor and helped me learn textiles, and we talked. Uh, she came in late in the afternoon, and we talked uh, about politics and sexuality, and we went on anti-war marches, and um, she became a dear friend and I, who, and I cherish that experience very much. She was the first person to ask me if I was gay and I said, I guess I am, but I'm trying to go straight because I was at the time I was going to a different therapist in New York to try to go straight as so many people did in those days. And this would have been before Stonewall? This was uh, before Stonewall in the earlier 60s, I, yeah, um, it was around 1960 that I first went to, uh, started in textiles, and then in 19, yes, so in, by, by, so I, I, I went to this wonderful therapist, he had escaped from Nazi Germany as a youth of 13 on his own. He had to leave overnight, uh, and it was lucky he did. Um, and a wonderful person, and he helped me affirm myself in various ways. He didn't think being gay was a problem. Um, he had come to that. He was a straight guy who had come to that because a uh, colleague that he respected had come out to him. The power of coming out. Um, so he had helped me feel better about myself and I was ready, I began to explore in the, maybe in 1970 or 71 definitely, I began, I began to explore the then beginning uh, gay liberation movement after, right after Stonewall. I did not go on the first march in 1970, I was still in the closet. Um, I think I, rem I, w I was working as a textile designer on salary then, and I was, it was in a building on 6th Avenue and 41st Street, and I knew that the march marched by there, and I think I remember coming in early one morning and reading the Times about this march that had passed by of homosexuals, and I didn't want anybody to see me reading this particular story in the New York Times, I think I was, you know, looking around. Um, but by 1971, I went with a woman from my from that office who was a friend, 
um, um, uh, on the, mar the, the gay march in, in June 71. That was my first, and we went by the office building that we both worked in. Faye was the woman who went with me to support me, a straight woman, friend from, from the office. And um, it was really nice of her to do that, to be so supportive. And, um, and then I began to explore, I guess, I had begun to explore going to some of the meetings of the Gay Activist Alliance. I remember they were meeting on a, at a church on, I think it's 28th Street and 9th Avenue, and it's still open to lots of uh, groups. And um, I remember thinking, I'm going to walk through that door. The first time I went to a meeting of the Gay Activist Alliance, I'm going to walk through that door, and it's going to change my life. I don't know how, and it was really scary to like do that act of walking through that door. Um, but and it did change my life. I began to go on demonstrations against um, homophobic New York City council members and. Um, um, different kinds of demonstrations saying, carrying signs, um, I am a homosexual, watch out, or whatever. Different kinds of signs, funny, sort of funny signs sometimes. Um, and um, in the winter of 1971, I was in a consciousness raising group. That's an old term from the time. Um, we would share our experiences together of being gay and being in the closet and, um, and... This was uh, through GAA? It was through the Gay Activist Alliance, even though the group was mostly a political group. There were, all, there were also these, uh, some of us wanted to get together and think about our, and talk about our feelings that we were fighting, the ne fighting against the negative feelings and feeling anger about the oppression that we had internalized and uh, it was uh, exciting, very exciting to do that. And at one of uh, a meeting, one of these meetings, it, uh, we were talking about ways to how to represent our new experience of being gay, our positive experience of being gay in the world. How, what, how to make, get that across to the public. And I thought, oh, well, maybe there I, I could research gay history and maybe I could put together a documentary play about gay history. Um, it, I think I had heard about the play about African-American history that Martin Duberman, the gay historian, had put together some years before called In White America. Um, based on documents of black American history. And so I think that's where the idea come from. I hadn't seen his play, but I'd heard about it. So I think that's where the idea came from, and I always give Marty that credit. Um, so I started researching, finding, you know, looking into what documents I could find that talked about homosexuality before Stonewall. And, um, and just one question. So, this, I mean, this was 1971. There yeah. weren't any queer historical studies available. What, what made you think that a, a gay history existed in the first place? Yes. Oh, well, I thought, oh, there must be gay history. There's black history that people haven't known much about. And I had done... Uh, these two, I had done two books about black American history. So I, that was also a history that wasn't that well known at the time. And it still is not well enough known. But um, so I thought, oh, there must be gay history. You know, and so I started to look around. I was a good researcher. I liked doing research. It's like detective work. When I grow up, I want to be a detective. That's uh, a line from a wonderful uh English uh, 
play and uh, it's a little kid saying it and I always think oh that's me um, I want to be a detective so I'll be a historian I can snoop into people's lives and their sex lives in particular um, and uh, it's all respectable to do it too. <laughs> um, so, so I started to look at, at materials that might be dramatic. I, the village voice uh, description of the uh, stone wall was this, it was sort of homophobic, but it was dramatic and sort of funny, and it conveyed the energy of the of the Stonewall riot. Uh, we call it, uh, uh, I call it, I like to call it a resistance or a rebellion rather than a riot. Um, so that was a good opening for this play. I used a one Walt Whitman poem. I began to research and love Walt Whitman's poetry. Um, I began to research his life. Um, I found Alexander Berkman's talking about, in a book published in 1912 about his experience in jail and falling in love with another man and, and having sex relations between men explained to him and it's really a wonderful, uh, amazing thing by a basically straight guy talking about this jail experience of his own. Um, that was in the play. Um, some funny stuff uh, about, uh, there was material, it's equal material uh, about lesbians. Um, I wrote a very dramatic last scene which was a, uh, a march and a gay in as we call them. Um, and I wrote these dramatic, polemical speeches for the last scene. I think they're quite well written and quite poetic. I still think they're pretty good. Um, and um, so the play was put on in June 1972 by the Gay Activist Alliance at 99 Worcester Street, which is now a watch shop. It's, it was in an old abandoned, well, it wasn't abandoned, I guess. It was in an old firehouse. And Soho was just, it was an industrial neighborhood without the industry. So artists were beginning to move into Soho and you could rent an old firehouse in Soho. Um, so the Gay Activist Alliance rented this old firehouse and then had dances every Saturday night to pay the rent. And they were, dances became very popular. So in the downstairs part of the firehouse, there was a big movie screen that they put up. And we had, we used that as the background to our, uh, to our stage on the ground floor of this firehouse. And, and um, we had rehearsed this play called Coming Out, exclamation point. That's very important, the exclamation point. Um, we had rehearsed this documentary play for six months. Um, so it was in good shape, and the director did a wonderful job, the director David Rogensack, uh, who was a theatrical press agent. So um, he it was very fluid, and the, though the actors were mostly amateur, they brought an intensity and a certain authenticity in their amateurness to the production. And because we had rehearsed it so well, and because the material was so new to people, and because it was so powerful, it became very powerful for a lot of people. It was the perfect play for that setting and that time period, and it, today it reads as a document from another era. So um, it was, so it was put on, oh, the day the play was to open, my phone rang at 10 o'clock in the morning, and it was my mother, and she said, is that you in the village voice? And I said, yes. And she said, why didn't you tell me? And it was my coming out to my mother. It was uh, amazing that it happened the morning of the play was to open. She had read about 
what had happened, she would read the village voice and she saw an advertisement for the play with my name on it. Mm-hmm. So my, oh, we had, we had, I had used a pseudonym on the original version of the script and I was using a pseudonym in my early days at the Gay Activist Alliance. And then I realized that we can't do a gay liberation play with a pseudonym. No, you can't do that anymore. I mean, you can't do a play called Coming Out with a, with a, with a pseudonym. <laughs> my pseudonym, though, was obvious. It was John Keats. Hmm. <laughs> well, so the play starts with the Stonewall Riots, but going back a few years, in 69, what did you know about the riots? What did you hear? What did you think about it? Or did you I know lived in the village and I barely heard about it. I don't think I heard about it at all. I heard about it afterwards. I think so. Um, so when, how do you think you heard about it afterwards, if, if you remember? Probably reading the New York Times. I read the New York Times quite well, so I read some little teeny report about it. It okay. didn't seem that important or... You know, there were, there were things about gays being arrested or it seemed like just every, like everything else. It, there's no, I had no sense it was this major event that, I mean, it's turned out to be a very influential, but at the time, in 1969, I didn't know that. I began to understand that when I started getting involved in the gay movement that, oh, this earlier rebellion had led to this uprising and this organizing, which was so important that people were getting together in organized form. It wasn't just individuals going off doing whatever, uh, um, but people in, in quite a large num- much larger numbers than before, although we were a very poor and very small number of people who actually had a large impact. Somehow or other, the time was right for us to have a large impact. Mm-hmm. Would you like to read a little bit from the documentary play? I don't know. I'll read Maybe. from the end. I'll from the from, end? I'll, okay. Yeah, those are the things I wrote, and they're very dramatic, and they're not so bad. I'm okay. Sorry. And uh, do you want to... But I can't see it without my glasses, because it's teeny. Oh, no. Uh, do you my want me... glasses, are, I, think are, I think they're on the table up there. On the desk? Are they on the desk? I'm going to take a drink of water. Or then they're downstairs on the table. Mm. Or on the, uh, I hope I haven't sent them. Oh, how does it look? Looks great. Good. I can't read this without my glasses. This teeny little type. Oh, nice photos too. So, oh, you found a okay. little teeny type. Uh, let's see, the last scene. Um, and before you read, do you want to just kind of set it up, set, set the scene, and say again what uh, you're reading yes. from? This. This is the, uh, the last um, scene from my play from nine, June 1972, coming out, and um, it's, uh, um, it's, a, it's a march demonstration, and it ends with these speeches that I wrote. So, um, we have reached the park. It's been a long, hot walk but we swarm in hundreds up the far hill, then turn and watch the the oncoming marchers, wave upon wave of sisters and brothers, multi-bannered and balloon-bearing, women and men of all descriptions are entering the park. Where have we all come from? And then, Um, different female speaker says, 
Today, together we have walked with joy under a blue sky and a yellow sun. For too long in the past, hiding from you straits, we were night creatures, sons of darkness, daughters of the shadows, fearful of light. For too long we were strangers in this land, queer people, fugitives, condemned to solitary, isolated, exiled, outlawed, mocked, pitied, denied, your bastard children consigned to oblivion. And another female speaker says, for too long without protest or resistance, we accept that it is natural that your politicians legislate us criminals, your police jail us for our outlawed acts, your psychiatrists deny our love legitimacy. Your preachers condemn us for our sin. Your, 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 <laughs> your oh, <laughs> so your, your preachers condemn us for, your, for our sin. Your armies discharge us with dishonor. We are not good enough to maim and kill for freedom. Your employers fire us. Your bullies beat us, your gangs rape us, your bigots murder us, your parents disown us, your comedians mock us, your liberals tolerate us. For too long we accepted this, all this, as deserved and natural. And then a male says, for too long in the, in the bars we eyed each other furtively without friendliness. In the streets, we, we sniffed and circled round each other, warily waiting. We met and mated like dogs in heat. We bargained for a little contact. We settled for these brief encounters, contracted in contempt. At night, in the darkness of the parks, we gave our bodies more freely than our names. We offered ourselves anonymously, like slaves on the auction block like traders in the marketplace. And then a male says, with vulture eyes we eyed each other hungrily as meat. With calculating glance, with cashier's hearts, we toted every score, accounted every number, had our little tricks. Street vendors, we peddled our own flesh and sold ourselves too cheap. In the past, defined by others, and this is a female says, in the past defined by others, lesbians and women, segregated, separated, we were divided from ourselves. Now in our struggle, we have taught ourselves to be ourselves, simply strong and gentle, women loving women. Now, for the first time, we are clear, we are clearly our double, we, we see clearly. Now, for the first time, we see clearly our double-faced oppression as females, as lesbians. Now we know to have our freedom, all sisters must be free. And a male says, in the past, uh, oh, this is a, 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 a black uh, actor. Uh, in the past, unmanned as black, put down as gay, uh, enslaved by the man, we thought we had to play the queen or play the stud. Now we are in battle to be ourselves, liberated men, sometimes tender, sometimes tough, but always black and gay and beautiful. And then a female says, for too long we have been your laughing stock. For too long we laughed with you and played the fool. For so long, for so many of us, there was something truly unspeakable about ourselves, a deep and secret shame. We wore the mask. Well, the masks are coming off. Your freaks are coming out fighting to face you in all our unnatural beauty. Like those proud blacks with their bushy naturals, we unnaturals are together coming out to fiercely assert and joyfully celebrate our natures fully, openly, without shame. And then up to you want me to go on with this?
That's probably a good taste. Okay. But I, so I, mean, I love that. It's you know it's both a play, but also of course now it's a historical document. Yes. Right? This is a document from another time. I I it's there's and there's a critique in it in the, in the speeches that I just read of. Uh, gay male cruising that um, I think I became less judgmental about that mm. um, uh, as it was a way of meeting under conditions that were difficult. To, it was hard to find other guys. Now it's easy because you just look on the internet. So. Uh, <laughs> Uh, on a dating site on the internet, but we didn't have that back then. So you looked around the streets and, you know, uh, and, and sexual encounters was, were one way that you met sometimes, a partner for a lifetime or not, you know. But just generally, I mean, what do you think that passage says about the gay liberation movement uh, of its time? Like, I mean, that was a very pivotal moment. Yeah, well, expresses, the talks express, and some of the later ones also express the, the anger about the, that for so long we believed this uh, crap that psychiatrists had put out, that, that, that religious so-called, uh, you know, there were some religious people had put out about homosexuals as sinners, the psychiatrists put out about homosexuals as uh, abnormal or un, un or whatever, you know. Uh, so uh, we were angry about that and some of this expresses that. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I think it's significant that you start the play with the Stonewall rebellions. Mm -hmm. And I was reading through that, that beginning and there are, you know, lines like, you know, limp wrists were forgotten, or, you know, that... Uh, that's that, from the Village Voice report of the Stone. Right. Wall. Yeah. Or, you know, that they're not dancing faggots, but a powerful rage. And then you quote Ginsburg as well, um, saying they've lost that wounded look that they all had 10 years ago. Yes. So I'm just thinking, can you talk a little bit about the significance of Stonewall, why maybe you decided to start the play with uh, Stonewall, um, what was so significant about mm -hmm. it? Well, by, by nine, June 1970, by the time I wrote the script in the winter of 1971, it was Stonewall was becoming, we, had, we were recognizing that this particular rebellion had led to this blossoming in a in a much more mass way, in a much more militant way than gays had gotten together in the past. Um, so Stonewall had by that time, yes, uh, become this symbolic uh, moment in LGBT history. It, that it has taken on since then. So it's interesting that, you know, how soon did that happen? That's a really interesting question. When, by how soon did, had Stonewall taken on that? So there it is at the beginning of my play. I, I think I put it there because it's so dramatic. And if you're doing a play, you want to get your audience right away and it's very dramatic police raid and we 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 did it we acted out a a non-naturalistic but a, a version of what was happening and the police and the gays resisting and uh, it was a great opening to the play so maybe I was just partly thinking of it oh it's dramatic it's a good opening but it's also a sign that Stonewall was already a uh, becoming this iconic moment in in uh, gay in, in LGBT history and just to spell it out and be explicit what was it symbolic of oh of gays getting together and in in a group not just facing uh, homophobia alone uh, as in the past 
and getting together and being angry about it and organizing in with others and uh, to do something about it and to, to try to change things. And what was the purpose of the, the play? Like, what did you hope it would accomplish in the world? The idea was to begin to show uh, that we had a resistance history, that we didn't have only have an oppression history, which was, which was. Uh, I had learned that that was important in studying black history, that you couldn't, it was too horrible to just study the awful part, the oppression part, the lynchings, and that you needed to also study and talk about the resistance part. I, it, was, it was something quite conscious I learned in doing my work on black history, so I brought that with me. It's a very important lesson I had learned. Um, in fact, um, a black friend said to me about one, a play that I did about a fugitive slave being returned to slavery. Oh, why do I need to know more about that? And I, oh, oh, oh. So the next, so I asked my father, what, aren't there some, tell me, what, what, isn't there, um, so, there are some, ex, there, there are some, historical incidents in which black people took the lead in resisting this return to slavery when uh, slave catchers were coming up north to try to get their fugitive slaves back into the south and back into slavery. And he pointed me to this uh, incident in Christiana, Pennsylvania in 1951, and I did a documentary play about that incident uh, for WBAI, the Pacifica Station in New York, and that was put on with actors acting out the roles. And then that turned into a, my, uh, I think, uh, uh, one of my early books, uh, the two early books I did on black history. So, um, and that, so uh, it was important that I learned the important, it's important for oppressed people to know their there's always been a resistance. If there's oppression, there's various kinds of resistance that people undertake to resist that oppression. So uh, I began to examine that in terms of LGBT history and um, that, um, that people, yeah, so um, there are both those histories represented in coming out play. Mm -hmm. And so how did the play develop into something larger? Like, where did you go from there? Well, because the director of the play, David Rogensack, was a, um, a professional in the uh, public, uh, in publicity uh, for theater, he knew uh, how to uh, get a tent, call up the New York Times and get them to do an article about uh, uh, the play and about uh, so, so there was an article about the play in the New York Times. Um, it got interesting publicity in other, some other mainstream newspapers, and I uh, got a publisher to offer me a book contract for a book of documents about LGBT uh, U.S. history, which turned into the book Gay American History, Lesbians and Gay Men in the USA published in 1976 at the end of the year, and I think it was December. So uh, that was uh, uh, my, first, uh, my first of my four books I've written on sexual history. And how did you do the research for that book? Oh, well, it was before the internet. So you had to go to the library, you had to go to archives, you had to actually go to these places. Um, it was detective work. Um, oh, you know, people have always asked me that. Well, how did you find all this? Well, when you started looking for it, it wasn't that hard to find. It was more that nobody had looked for it. So at a party, for instance, I was, I was obsessed. So everybody knew I was looking for material about LGBT history. We called it gay and lesbian history <laughs> at the time. And... 
Um, so at a party, somebody said to me, oh, you should look at these. Alexander Hamilton wrote love letters to John Lorenz during the American Revolution. I said, really? I never heard of that. They didn't tell me that in history class. And so I went to the library and looked at these letters and they, John Alexander Hamilton wrote love, there are love letters all right. He loved this man and there are sexual jokes in the letters and I don't know what they did together, but um, it was a, it was a, he loved him. Um, so, I mean, part of what we were asserting that in the gay liberation movement that we weren't only sexual creatures, we were loving creatures. We are, it was a, a, about affection and sexuality, uh, feelings and, and sexuality. We were whole people. We were defined previously just by our sexuality, which was perverted, they said. So uh, we wanted to affirm that we were people of complex variety. And I thought that it's, the history what seemed important to me uh, as a way of going against the very banal and superficial stereotypes of homosexuals that had appeared in the media. Uh, I, we, we looked askance on the boys and the band, and the, it seemed that those were uh, quite, you know, uh, we, we in the gay movement criticized that, those kinds of images of, of uh, self-hating homosexuals. We were struggling to get over that, and they were in the middle of it from an earlier period. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you mentioned in the introduction um, that you wanted to approach uh, homosexuals not purely from a, a psychological framework, oh, yes. or but also emphasizing a quote history of homosexuals as a social group. Yes, that, that was really important because mostly homosexuals have been defined by psychologists. So it was this uh, psychological and negative, uh, largely negative um, definition. And so to see homosexuals as social, as a social group, and um, as a, as a um, put down minority group, oh, that was a new insight for me. Homosexuals are a minor, an oppressed minority, like like um, um, like black people, oh, oh. And even though women were not a minority, but they were put down, I was, I was aware of that. I was reading, I read Simone de Beauvoir and uh, had some feminist inklings at, at the time. Uh, I guess more than inklings. Um, so I was aware that women were in various ways put down and prevented from fully uh, participating. I knew women had not had to vote and stuff like that from my you know, early days in the 20th century. Um, so but it was a new, it was a new insight. Oh, homosexuals as an as a, as a oppressed group. Oh, that was a new idea for me because I had grown up with this psychological idea. That's all I heard as a youth. And I mean, I think that was a new idea for most people at the yeah, time. It was a shock, a shocking new idea. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, you really, you're, oh, you went like that. Oh, it's a new orientation to the world. Um, should we, should I ask this guy to just wait on this? For is it? Uh, I see him. Yeah. Oh, is the guy in back? Yeah, he just showed up. Oh, yeah. he's. Do you want? He's very artfully painted. He's, he's. Yeah. So set it up. Set it up first. Um. So, uh, this is my book, Gay American History, published in 1976, and the publisher sent me on a um, a tour around the country. They were willing to spend money in those days and to publicize a book. I, I didn't want to fly, so they sent me on a train around the country. And um, there were some wonderful interviews by Studs Terkel, that was one of the great ones. 
in Chicago, and um, and then there were some amazingly crazy events where, like, I was on a show in California in which it was like vaudeville. It was like we were all waiting in the green room to go on, and I was saying, oh, what do you do? Oh, I throw darts at this woman in a bathing suit, poison darts. And oh, and what do you do? I, oh, I wrote a book about gay history. Oh, what do you do? Oh, Morris the Cat was interviewed on, on that show, I think. And he got a higher billing than I did. And Morris, you were the, all He was a cat that wacky. was in lots of commercials. <laughs> Morris the Cat got more of a video to, coverage than I did. So anyway, um, it was quite a scene. Anyway, the book got quite a lot of publicity. It was the, like one of the first serious books about gay anything, anything gay that was a serious scholarly book. Um, so it's a, it's a collection of documents. Um, it shows that there was it was important that it be a collection of documents because that showed that I didn't just make this stuff up. It's like, there's the document to prove it. So it, it was, it had an impact that because of it being a book of documents as opposed to a narrative history. Um, and uh, it has different sections and um, one of the sections is about oppression, one is about uh, resistance, one is about Native Americans and how far back the uh, Native Americans in, in LGBT history goes. Uh, another was about, uh, oh, love. One was about, one whole section was about love stories. Uh, again, uh, not, we're not just sexual, we're loving and we're affectionate and, and we're sexual. Um, so the beginning is quite dramatic. It's not a scholarly beginning. It's still a document from another time. And I began in this introduction, say, uh, in this, the second paragraph of the introduction says, in recent years, the liberate... Oh, oh sorry. Yeah. You say that Trump beeping. We should just, I think we should start that bit again. <clears throat> Trump back in a bit. Okay, now? Yeah. In recent years, the liberation movements of lesbians and gay men have politicized, given historical dimension to, and radically altered the traditional concept of homosexuality as well as the social situation, relations, ideas, and emotions of some homosexuals. Those of us affected by this movement have experienced a basic change in our sense of self. As we acted upon our society, we acted upon ourselves. As we changed the world, we changed our minds. Sexual subversives, we overturned our psychic states. From a sense of our homosexuality as a personal and devastating fate, a private, secret shame, we moved with often dizzying speed to the consciousness of ourselves as members of an oppressed social group. As the personal and political came together in our lives, so it merged in our heads, and we came to see the previously hidden connection between our private lives and public selves. We were politicized body and soul. In one quick, bright flash, we experienced a secular revelation. We too were among America's mistreated. We moved in a brief span of time from a sense that there was something deeply wrong with us to the realization that there was something radically wrong with that society that had put us down, uh, that it's done, which had done its best to destroy us. We moved from various forms of self-negation to newfound outrage and action against these lethal conditions. 
from hiding our sexual and effectual natures, we moved to public. We, from hiding our sexual and effectual natures, we moved to publicly affirm a deep and good part of our being. Starting with a sense of ourselves as characters in a closet drama, the passive victims of a family tragedy, we experienced ourselves as initiators and assertive actors in a movement for social change. We experienced the present as history, ourselves as history makers. In our lives and in our hearts, we experienced the change from one historical form of homosexuality to another. We experienced homosexuality as historical. Anytime you hear the truck beat, we hear the truck beat. Okay. Just, yeah. So, the, there were a lot the of car it. was yeah. beeping. Yeah, they're doing a lot of construction outside of the block. Yeah, there's just a truck that's in the back of the truck. Yeah. And it's like the back of the Oh, yeah. I don't, I mean, there's nothing we can do about that. So, right? um, should I read it over again? Ugh. It might be worth it, yeah. Okay. I'm not sure. I, 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 I hate to do it and then start again. So. Yeah. Do you hear that? Oh, uh, there it is again. Why is it, why are they, why is it repeating? I, Is I it, think that's going to be going on. Huh? There's a, a crane. Oh, a crane. Uh, next door. Oh, oh, that's what it is. Well. At your Arcus friend's place. Uh, her. Well. Right, read it over. Can you solo just a little? Get read it over and hope for the best. It's mostly just for the review and the interview also. Oh, there it is again. Oh, God. Well, should we move? to close these doors and move it in there? What, I mean, what? We, uh, I, I, can, I can close the shutters and see if that cuts down on the, the noise. Lighting will change. Lighting will change. Um, I mean, how, yeah. I don't know. Is that kind of thing important to you? I, I, I don't know how to make this call. Hmm. I, I, and also moving back to early. not consistent. No, which is actually worse. Oh, yeah. Think. <laughs> if you want to oh. use one section and then one section. No, there it is again. Yeah. Uh. I don't think there's anything we can do. I mean, it's it's being filmed in New York, so maybe that makes it seem authentic. Sure. sure. I don't know. Yeah. Um, it's very annoying, isn't it? Mm -hmm. What do you think of that and setting it up here? You should have done it in a different place. I meant to tell you that. In the books, I thought. Mm. Well, I mean, I, I think it's even, we have to set up a lot to separate ourselves from these sounds. It would carry through even if we close these heavy doors. Yeah. Mm. It would help, but it would help. It yeah. Was, it would still be there. Yeah. Yeah, it's already making its way down a block and through some other stuff. So yeah. Hmm. Like, yeah. Well, you said it's already what? Making its way. Yeah, I'm halfway down the block. And I'm not really crazy. <laughs> Uh, 
why don't we no. just see if it if it resolves? Um, I also wanted you to uh, read the last two paragraphs on page eight and nine. Uh, the starting with the knowledge of gay history. Mm. Okay. And maybe set it up and say I'm reading from. Oh. Uh, page eight and nine from the, the end of my introduction and that kind of thing. Oh. Um, this is uh, the end of my introduction from page eight and nine um, from the introduction to gay American history. Um, and it's, it's dated September 1st, 1976. That's when I wrote this. And it says, Knowledge of gay history helps restore a, a people to its past, to itself. It extends the range of human possibility, suggests new ways of living, new ways of loving. The study of homosexual history suggests a new basis for a radical critique of American society. The study of homosexual social life raises questions about the sexual division of labor and power, the manifestation of male domination and female oppression, the character of same-sex relationships and indirectly of relations between the sexes, the nature of masculinity and femininity, the influence of socially assigned sex roles, the character of family life and marriage, the role of religious, legislative, judicial, medical, and psychological professions in the social creation of pain, and the various effects of sexism on the quality of social life. Finally, the study of the gay past raises the question of whether the this society can accommodate the demands of America's dispossessed for power and control over the machinery by which we make, uh, by which they make their lives. Most gay people now see the ending of homosexual oppression in America as a matter of law reform, of obtaining civil rights, and of fitting into the society as it is constituted. Others, myself among them, see the movement for gay law reform and civil rights as only the present form of a much larger struggle of gay people and others for power and control over those social institutions which most affect our lives. In this view, gay liberation is part of that national and worldwide organization of activity for radical social change, in which each group, starting from a sense of its own particular oppression, is struggling for the democratic control of that society in which all we all work, uh, live, and try to love. Okay. So is that unusable then? Um, it's, I don't, I don't, we don't know what, what this is being used for. It's what you have to say. Um, okay, it's, 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 it's usable, but it's um, something you're using. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, I, mean, I, mean, I, think, I think the only thing that we can do is just keep, keep going. I mean, right? Unless we, unless yeah. we want to pause for like an hour and see. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think we're ending the, we're, we're nearing the end of the interview anyway. It's, it's 1.30. We were going to talk about the play and the book, right? Um, it's up to you. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, maybe as t to kind of wrap up the interview, that, that last paragraph you read, um, this kind of radical democratic kind of uh, uh, view of, of social change that was coming out of the 1960s, the gay liberation movement, 
when you look back on that, uh, how do you assess the where we're going through now in the country, where we're going through with the uh, the gay uh, movement, just kind of generally? Well, the, the gay legal movement has been very successful in getting a lot of change through, and I'm very, I'm glad about that. Um, I'm, I was expressing a, a, a more a, a radical hope for for more fundamental for fundamental change for the for the for the uh, control by people over their society. It's a democratic aspiration. Democracy is a really um, radical idea. If you really want to carry it into economics uh, and other areas. Um, so um, I, this was part of uh, a much stronger part of the movement that I was part of in the early 1970s. So we thought of our movement as part of this a worldwide movement for people's control over their environment and their society. And, um, I still believe in that. That's what I'm still for as a radical person. Um, and it's a utopian dream, um, but I think we need utopian dreams. We need to be able to think of better futures for humanity, for ourselves. We need to be audacious in our dreams. Mm -hmm. And because this project is focusing on the legacy of, of Stonewall, Yes. Um, I, I imagine that you have a unique uh, view on that as a gay historian. Um, what, what, what do you think about, you know, I guess the, the historical Stonewall as well as all of the mythology that's, that's surrounded it? Well, uh, there it turns out that uh, historians have begun to publicize all the other resistances that took place before Stonewall, I, I've helped publicize that. I've talked about the importance of resistance history and other historians have begun to show there were, there were other resistances before that didn't seem to have the same impact, that didn't have become iconic in the same way that Stonewall has become. So, um, but it's good to know that there were these earlier resistances because that resistance history is so important. Um, it wasn't just this one event that suddenly changed everything. There was years and years of slugging it out. Uh, a few really courageous lesbian and gay men and transgender people were uh, getting together in very few numbers and they were afraid but they went ahead anyway. And, in the homophile movement earlier before Stonewall. And uh, that's a fascinating history that we don't know enough about. Mm -hmm. And I hope that this 50th anniversary of Stonewall helps us all think about all the work that went into resisting uh, before Stonewall, uh, that earlier history of resistance of LGBT, uh, courageous people uh, before Stonewall. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious about the, the research. Would you mind putting your glasses down? I can hear you. Oh, kind of sure. Nice. Um, the research you did for Gay American History, I, looking back, what was the most surprising thing you found? And maybe not a particular fact, um, but just in general, what was surprising to you or, or shocking or, um, I don't know, powerful for you about what you found in that process? Well, one of the chapters in, in Gay American History is about the oppression of homosexuals by the medical profession, psychiatrists and psychologists, and uh, some of the, they were tortures that were done to gay people. Uh, of various kinds, uh, chemicals that were given to people to try to change their sexual orientations. There were electric shock treatment and uh, talking to a man who had been uh, given electric shock treatment. Uh, there's an interview with him in, 
in that section and that was that was uh, difficult to sit with this person and hear this awful story um, so that was some of the most shocking material it's this direct uh, physical coercion of people to try to change their uh, sexuality um, it was a form of terrorism and um, it was also exciting to discover this history of resistance and start to learn about Walt Whitman and, and his fascinating life and loves and uh, amazing poetry which is still uh, amazingly resonant even so many years after he wrote it. It still reads as fresh and alive. Mm -hmm. Can you give one other example of a resistance history that you included in your book? Um, I interviewed Barbara Giddings um, uh, about um, her uh, work in, uh, um, in the Daughters of Blitis, it was called, a very indirect name. <laughs> they didn't want the word lesbian in the name of the organization, so they picked some obscure name. Um, it was very courageous, and you had to be real. She was really tough. You had to be really tough to be one of the few people involved in a lesbian group, and um, they published. She uh, helped get out the ladder the a lesbian periodical that helped communicate with women across the country. It was really fun talking to her and doing an interview with her in Philadelphia, I think it was. Um, uh, yeah, that was uh, stood out in my mind. Hmm. Is there anything that you think we should touch on or make sure we record as part of a, a documentary of Stonewall and early gay liberation in New York? I think we've touched on a lot of stuff. Okay. Yeah. Can you stop there? Um, yeah, we can cut there. Uh, yeah, the sound is really unfortunate. Yeah. Um,